нас звуки и гип-хоп. Мы э, начинаем. Э, Дэнни Бойл. Э, и э, давайте, не откладывая долгий ящик, на сегодня долгое время, э, поднимайте руки и начнем. А, да, пожалуйста. Especially in Edinburgh, that you that you visibly noticed, the city is much more dynamic now than, than it was 20 years ago. It's full of student, a student population, a young population, and a, um, and, a and a migrant population that are seeking work and, and looking to build their lives there. And it's a much more exciting city because of it, you know. So we were heartbroken when Brexit happened, because we wanted to remain part of, an ex of, of Europe. Um, and I think Scotland, Scotland voted to stay in Europe. It was England that voted out. And I think if Brexit does happen, Scotland will, Scotland will choose Europe. So you know in the movie it's choose life, Scotland will choose Europe, not England. So they will leave England and stay in Europe, I think. Yeah, She was very good, that girl, at the beginning, in the kill. She was only, I got one line, but she was very good. She, she was a student in, um, in Scotland, from Czechoslovakia, I think. Mr. Wolf, здравствуйте. Спасибо большое за ваш фильм. Чудесен, просто чудесный фильм. Скажите, пожалуйста, меня зовут Андрей Чумонин, это вы на радио.ру. Скажите, пожалуйста, у вас фильм... Одну секунду, пожалуйста, подождите. Hi, hello. <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Да, у ваших фильмов очень часто очень жесткий, высокий рейтинг по ограничению по возрасту. В данном случае у вас вообще 18 плюс в России на такой рейтинге. Часто ли вы приходите, приходится идти вам на компромисс, чтобы снизить какие-то, чтобы снизить порог возрастной ценз? Например, на уровне сценария, как вы работаете с сценаристом, на уровне продюсеров, они вас спросят, а вы не можете, например, убрать сцену, то ли изнут. Или все-таки не получается у вас идти на компромисс в данном случае. Спасибо. What's wonderful about the characters is that they have their own voice. And it is very unique and troubling at times. Um, it's very funny, and very individual, and very defiant. And they come from a class of people who are normally de denied a voice. That, that, and they refuse to be traditional victims. You know, so you could view them as being, to have pity on them, or, or you could view them as evil. But we don't view them like that at all. They are who they are. So we would never compromise that voice in our depiction of them. Even though you are correct, if this film, we, we've done very well in the UK, where it was released two weeks ago. But if we had gone for a lower certificate, like a PG-13, it would have made much more money. Because, you know, but we would never compromise that. That's the studios want you. Hollywood would like you to always take those things out so they could make more money out of it. And the, dan the danger with that is that you end up with every movie will be a Pixar movie because they're wonderful movies and everybody can see them. But that's, I'm not challenging that, that's wonderful, but you want these other, these ones around the outside that are a bit more troubling and dangerous and difficult. And, and we were just talking about Lars von Trier as a filmmaker. You know, that there are difficult characters and situations and films out there as well. 
Да, пожалуйста. Расскажите, пожалуйста, как проходило примирение с Юином Макгрегором и было ли оно вообще, и как проходили съемки Юина, и была ли вероятность снять какого-то другого актера, если вдруг вы не помирились, например, Ди Каприо? We, we fell out over the beach, as you know, I can tell you know. Um, and we didn't speak to each other for quite a long time. In fact, it was very embarrassing. We were, we were both in Shanghai, and we got a flight back to London together. And we sat on opposite sides, <laughs> and we didn't speak to each other. Because the British are like that. We're kind of like, you know, we're not very good at emotion sometimes. So you kind of sit here, and he sat there for like nine, twelve hours. Um, but eventually we did speak, and he's a lovely man, actually, Ewan. He was very gracious, he forgave us, because really we didn't treat him very well. And it was wonderful to have him back uh, working with him, because he's a clarinet. I call it, you know a musical instrument? When you hear Mozart play the clarinet concerto, it's something... It's just beyond beauty, it's so beautiful. And Ewan's like that to me. He's a clarinet, he speaks so, his pitch is so perfect about things, about. And so it was wonderful to get back working with him and to hear him do a Choose Life speech and a, you know, and, and to hear him say, I'm 46 and I'm fucked. It's really shocking, really shocking, you know, because you, because he's such a kind of, you think he'd be, you know, he looks good still, you know? But he's saying, my heart, it's like, and that's, the film is very personal. Um, I was talking to Anton about this earlier. It's a, it's a very personal film for me and the screenwriter, John Hodge, and about time and aging and masculinity. And so to do something personal like that, it was wonderful to have that personal relationship with you and McGregor again. Yeah. Leo's uh, a great guy as well, but. <laughs> <laughs> but you and Berlin for this. Да, пожалуйста. Добрый день, Мария Свешникова, Вести.ру. 20 лет назад, когда вы сняли первый фильм, наркоманы, говори... наркоманы которые пытались завязать, говорили, что они не могут его смотреть, потому что некоторые сцены для них были, ну, скажем, искушением. А наркоманы, которые живут, ну, были действующими наркоманами, что ли, они говорили, что тоже не могут смотреть, потому что ну, слишком реально, что ли, вы их описали. И не очень <смех> привлекательно они выглядели. Вы разговаривали, были ли какие-то фокус-группы, или, может быть, кто-то уже видел вторую часть. Какая реакция была на него, на этот новый фильм? И, простите, я не могу держаться от второго вопроса. Он может быть полушутливый. Вы уже работали с Бенедиктом Кимбербечем. Почему бы не сняли его хотя бы в каком-то эпизоде Мелька на роль второго третьего плана? Спасибо. Are you a big fan of Sherlock? Does Sherlock play? Everybody sees Sherlock here, yeah? Yeah, yeah he's great, Benedict. And I have worked with him. Um, with Johnny Lee Miller, of course, who's in... We did a play together, Frankenstein, and, and Johnny's in that as well, and they shared the top. Anyway, no, Benedict wouldn't be right for this particular film. He's a very different kind of actor, really, in a way. Um, we did have Sony, who released the film. Um, we did have, they did do focus groups before the film was made, even, before we'd actually shot the film, asking people what they wanted from a sequel. And um, they said three things. They wanted all the actors to be, the, the, the four male actors to be the same actors again, that they couldn't replace any of them. So no place for Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, um, they, they wanted Kelly MacDonald to be back in it. And they wanted the soundtrack to be as good as the first soundtrack. So that was, so no pressure there. Um, But none of them asked whether it would be the same director, so um, which is a great shame. <laughs> um, 
Um, what we, what we wouldn't do is compromise, as I said earlier, we wouldn't compromise some of what's depicted. You know, that there is there's some very funny, seductive stuff, but there's all sorts of ugly, horrible things happen as well. And I think it's that mixture of the beautiful and the profane that actually makes it, gives it its quality. Um, so we would never compromise that, even if a focus group asked for it. You can retain that. If you, if you want a lot of money to make a film, either for your own personal greed or for, you know, to, so that you can have explosions happening every few minutes. If you take 50, 60 million dollars to make the film, then you do have to change things to make it more palatable. Um, but we, we deliberately took a small amount of money, more money than the first film, obviously, but um, so that we could keep control <coughs> over it. And we did have, again, we had drug recovery groups working on the film with us. So in the, in, the, in the scene in the club, the 1690 scene, where they sing No More Catholics, No More Catholics. That's, a, that's an ironic scene, by the way. It's like not literally saying No More Catholics. Um, the, um, uh, there were, a lot of those people were from drug recovery groups who were helping us. And they, they love the films, actually, although they do find them painful to watch as well. Uh, yeah, please. Those, you know, what was that at the end? Alien. Ah, oh, Alien Four. Right, got it. Cool. <clears throat> we uh, there is an idea for uh, Twenty Eight Days Later Three. <laughs> um, I don't know whether I'd want to do it now after a, just having done a sequel. But there is an idea for it. It's not very far advanced yet, but we have started talking about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I got briefly involved in Alien 4 um, a long time ago, but it was, I, 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 it was too much money. I, I'm not very good at making those huge films that cost an enormous amount of money and, you know, blockbusters, they're not really my cup of tea. That's an English expression we say, which is, it just doesn't, it just doesn't suit me. I much prefer to make something smaller and more aggressive and adventurous about how it goes about achieving its impact on you. And so that's what I've always tried to do. Apart from the beach, actually. The beach was a big budget, and it didn't really suit me. I, 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 it's just a personal thing. I, I operate better with a smaller group of people who I can evangelize and, and make pregnant with the film, make them want to make the film together, rather than an army of people who you'll never get to know everybody's name because there's so many people involved. You know credits on films these days, when you go to those movies, they've got 10 minutes of credits at the end of all the people who worked on the film. And how are you ever gonna learn all those names? You just can't, you know? So it's always gonna be more impersonal. Whereas I like to make them, I like the crew to feel like they're personally involved. Um, I, 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 did I, I missed the first question, sorry. Oh, can I expand on it? Yeah, on the idea. On the idea. No. <laughs> no. Because when we made the first one, there's been a lot of zombie movies since then. Walking Dead. You know, it's just endless zombie things since yeah, then. Yeah. Just more and more and more of them. So there's not many ideas left, actually. So I daren't mention what the idea is. So. Not that I don't trust you, obviously. <laughs> Being a member of the press. You wouldn't say it to anyone. You wouldn't mention it to anyone. Welcome to Moscow. Hope you are not frozen. Very nice to meet you. And <laughs> вопрос, uh, вы еще и режиссер самой крутой церемонии. Uh, в 2013 году мы поставили церемонию открытия Лондонской Олимпиады, которую признали лучшей в мире. А ровно три года назад весь мир увидел церемонию открытия Олимпиады в Сочи, которую тоже признали лучшей в мире за всю историю Олимпиад. Какую церемонию вы лично считаете лучшей? Почему? Можете ли вы их сравнить? 
И помощь да, нужна да, ваша. Да. В следующем году Россия принимает чемпионат мира по футболу. Опять нам нужно ставить церемонию открытия. Она должна быть короче и проще. Что можете нам посоветовать? Какие-то технические фишки? Мы не скажем, что это ну, от вас. Спасибо. I was, um, I was very, I was very proud to do the London opening ceremony. I live very near the stadium. I'm a huge, uh, I've always been an Olympics fan. Sports, I love, absolutely adore, and uh, so I was very proud to represent my country. In Britain, we often uh, we apologise all the time, partly because of, for all sorts of psychological reasons and political reasons. But occasionally, it was, it was very important for us to say, no, we're okay, we're a decent country. And so I was very proud to represent it like that. Um, I like Russia a lot. I've been here five times. And I, had, I was telling Anton, I had the, it was my, my 60th birthday in October. And my daughters took me to, uh, on the Trans-Siberian to Lake Baikal. I've always wanted to swim in Lake Baikal, always. And I don't know why, I've just been fascinated by it. And we did. And we, did. we were four days, four nights on the Trans-Siberian. It was an amazing experience. So if I was doing an opening ceremony for you, I would set it in Lake Baikal. Прекрасная идея. Да, пожалуйста. Наталья Шинева, Руинство Раша. Welcome to Russia. Мой вопрос касается, не могу не спросить про саундтрек фильма, особенно поскольку уже об этом зашла речь. Вы сами упомянули, что это было одно из требований, чтобы саундтрек был не менее хороший, чем к первой части, по мне, мы это удалось. Кроме всех, кроме всем известных боевичков и хитов, в этом, фильме, в этом саундтреке появились также новые группы of Alice, Fat Time Family и любимая многими в России группа Young Fathers, шотландская. Как вы считаете, что именно отображает саундтрек этого фильма, именно песни молодых команд, конкретно этой группы Young Fathers, какой компонент шотландской жизни, и почему вы выбрали именно эти группы из молодых? Спасибо. That we wanted to invoke some of the old sound, and we wanted the film to be aware almost of the other film, so that it would use elements. So that lust for life is obviously part of it, and but we we always said that if we were going to have something like that, it would be remix. It wouldn't be an exact, uh, the exactly the same as the original. So we got a prodigy remix of Lust for Life. And Rick Smith from Underworld reimagined Born Slippy. So there were memories of the first film. But we also wanted half of it to be new, like music that's brand new now. And there's an amazing band in Scotland from Edinburgh called Young Fathers, who are the modern heartbeat of the film. In the way the original film, Underworld, were the heartbeat of that film, this film is the Young Fathers are the heartbeat of the film. And although they're writing their songs, 25 years after Irving Welsh first wrote his books, they fit perfectly because they come from the same estates, the same social milieu that Irving comes from and wrote his stories about. It. So there's a connection there across time, really. So it was great to use that. Yeah. Uh, that Не могу не удержаться, как коллега просила передать вам, что вы самый лучший и самый лучший фильм снимаетесь. Привет вам от нас всем. Хотела еще вот это. У вас сегодня начинается ретроспектива картин в Москве. Этого достаются люди обычно с бэкграундом большим, с хорошей фильмографией. Вот что для вас такие мероприятия? И вот сегодня вы проводите не в самом большом кинотеатре Москвы. Вы, если бы наверняка могли собрать Кремль, как вам yeah. кажется, могли бы вы свой фильм показать в Кремле? Do, do they screen films in the Kremlin? Yeah. Do they have a do they have a screen? Very rarely. Like we've got one. Is that right? Well, obviously, um, 
Russia, I mean, <coughs> I mean, Russia has Tarkovsky. I mean, for, for Western filmmakers, that's a, a god, really. Like, I don't know what you guys regard him as, but when you when you learn in film, learning about film, there's certain key people, you know. Citizen Kane is one, Orson Welles is Citizen Kane. You know, there's certain things that you have to know. You have to know.